You know, it's an important tool, and if, and hopefully you'll at some point take some um, like linear algebra class or um, numerical linear algebra class and get a very different perspective on how it works uh, from that point of view. And I won't talk about how to compute it so much, but on the properties of it and, and how to use it. Um, so, um, so let's remember the problem. So we've we've got a point set, and so in general we'll be in. You know the points that will be in in RD, um, but it's it's hard to draw things in, in RD. So for drawing, I'll draw them in R2, which is the plane. And so you're going to have um, a bunch of points. And so then, what the goal is going to be to somehow decompose the dimensions of the space. And in particular, you want to find the the key thing in 2D is to find a one-dimensional subspace that represents this data. In higher dimensions, you can find a higher dimensional subspace that represents the data. And, and if remember from the linear regression, the, the common least squares linear regression, we're often minimizing this, this vertical distance. But with the SVD and the PCA, we're going to be minimizing these, these distances that are projecting onto this, this, this line or this subspace in general. Okay? So, and um, the, the goal in 2D is to um, give it a set of points and then given, um, um, then let's say we have a line, uh, let's, um, so we're going to assume that um, just for simplicity, that the, the average x and average y coordinate of all the points is zero. So we're going to have that the, that the average x and average y is zero, so this line is going to go through the origin. Okay, so, so then we can represent this line um, by a vector v. Um, This will be represented by a vector v, and so you can think of now this vector as being like this. Um, so this is a unit vector that's going to be um, it's going to be along here, and so this is all we need to do to describe this line. You can think of continuing it to be a line, and so this can be you can think of describing a vector by a point. So, 
So okay, so now we have this vector, and to get, um, and so this vector will represent is is going to represent this line, and what we want to do is start from a point here and project it onto this line of this point. Right, so, so this will be the line's representation of this point. Remember, we talked about we're going to have data, we're going to fit the simple model to it that is not too far from it. This line is the bottom, so I use this notation on Monday as well. Okay, so um, how do you get this projection with this, with this vector? So then L of P is going to be equal to um, V dot P. So this is, is, is the dot product. Um, and this is going to be times v. Um, actually, you know, um, and oh, we're going to assume um, ass um, ass assume that the norm of v is one, so that we're not worrying. Otherwise, you get some scaling issues. But so this simple dot product. So this, the output of this is a scalar. This is a value, and this is a vector. And what this says is this is a certain distance along this vector. So it's, in fact, along this vector and a distance here, and it gives you the location of this point. Okay, so, and this distance is, is the dot product of P onto, onto this vector V. So if you have this vector, um, and this is a unit vector, um, then the dot product of a point P is going to be, if you project, if you look at the right angle onto this line, it's going to be the distance of this right angle. Um, that's what the dot product is getting you. And just remember, if you're an RD, then V dot P is equal to the, the sum of um, I equals 1 to D of PI times um, um, times vi, so you multiply the components and you add them all together, right? So this is a very simple operation. You're doing do this projection, and then the goal is to find the vector that's that minimizes. So that, so what we're going to say is that this vector um, v star, the, the one that we want to find, is going to be r min of all vectors um, um, such that. Um, the norm is equal to one of um, of this of um, of p minus l of p squared. So I'm going to look at all of these distances and square them, and I want to minimize that. So I want to minimize the sum of these errors in this case. So this looks a lot like this least squares. Um, regression problem we talked about on Monday, um, but the regression problem is minimizing the vertical distance. Here we're minimizing this distance of this projection. And so the, the principal component analysis or the singular value decomposition is going to solve this problem for us. It's going to give us, um, it's, it's going to give us this solution. Yeah. So PCA and SVD are two different ways to get Well, there, there are two different names. The, the SVD is actually uh, a way of decomposing um, a matrix, and and the decomposition will give you um, this vector and a bunch of other information as well. Um, and PCA is generally the technique of using the SVD, or you could you could do a, you could do PCA without the SVD. There are other kind of numerical techniques you could use. PCA is the general way of finding um, these these uh, these. These are linear components of the data, um, and the SVD will be the, the tool that we use to do it. Um, um, okay, so we're going to spend today finding this, this vector, and in fact, in higher dimensions, this will actually be maybe a, uh, a subspace. Maybe you're in 10 dimensional points and you're finding a two dimensional subspace that you project onto the two dimensional subspace. And then you can do you can do this projection in a similar way. You break it into these or these orthogonal components and project on each of them. And we'll, we'll describe a little bit about how you would do that as we go. 
Um, okay. Um, so the, the key tool that we'll be using is going to be the SVD. And um, oh yeah. So, so 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 before we do this, we need to rethink about this data instead of as a point set. We're going to think of it as a matrix. So we're going to convert from from P into this this other abstract um, um, representation. So P may have already been abstract representation of the data, but we're going to convert it into another one, um, which is also P. Um, but it's just going to be a different way of writing it. This this is a point set. This is a matrix. There's just a different way of thinking about it. And so, um, so I, I'm going to draw kind of, well, OK, so, so, so what it's going to be is you're going to have, um, uh, let me make sure I get columns and rows right, because I always mix these up. Um, so you're going to have, if you, so usually the the size of p is going to be n. So, so this is the number of points, and and in R d, and this is the dimension of the space. And so the number of rows you're going to have n rows of the matrix, and you're going to have d uh, um, columns of this matrix. So now each of the rows should be a straight row. You write these crooked rows here, your data will be confusing. So, um, each, each row of the matrix is going to correspond to a point. This is P1, P2, up to P uh, um, up to PD, where where um, where for a point in in your in your point set. I can write this, you know, as, as these coordinates of this point. Right, so I can write the coordinates. So this point is maybe at um, two, four. Then it would be two in the in the first column, four in the second column. Right. Okay, and then each of the columns is going to represent all the data along one dimension. The origin, right here. So, um, so if the data is not centered, right? So I, I assumed. So I, I made this assumption um, that um, for all i in 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 d, that that um, p i is, is equal to zero. This is the average p i. This is equal to sum of p and p of p i and all this one over the size of p. Right. So this is the average in each dimension of zero. So and um, yes and no. Um, so you you can do it. Um, and then your data is really fit through the center of the points. If you don't do it, then so oftentimes then the, the first um, component you find is going to be pointing towards the average. So that the first component you find, you're going to do this principal component analysis, and the first one you find is going to be pointing towards the average, and you'll kind of discover it anyways. But it could be that it's really close to the average, and the first one is telling you a mix of information. So you're gonna kind of save an extra extra dimension. Uh, you're gonna maybe learn a bit more of the data if you if if you do this first. Um, but you can you can do it without doing that. And so say um, it, it's so it d depends on the application. So sometimes it your data still makes sense if you subtract out the mean and you you center it. Sometimes. You're saying you're looking at income, right? And you, income can never be negative. Well, 
you know, if you're not good at the stock market, if your income is negative, but you know, then your average income is negative is probably probably not the case. Um, I guess unless you're in a closed society. Um, but um, so, but the, there are probably cases where you don't want to subtract out, and then you want to find kind of uh, the major trends in the data going away from zero, and it'll tell you something slightly else. Um, so, uh, so hopefully you'll get more intuition of what that means as I as I keep. Explain what it's going on. Is there, is there another question? Or? Okay. Um, okay. So you can take this this point set and represent it as this as this matrix, right? And and you know if your point set is not like sparse or anything like that, then this isn't really wasting any more space. Your data we talked about sparse data before, and then this matrix could really blow up the space. But in this case, that's not not necessarily going to be true. Um, okay, so then the the SVD um, the, the SVD is is going to be some operator that unless you you know like to mess with Fortran or something, you're never going to actually write um, actually write an SVD. Um, so there, so what you're going to get is. Um, so I, I'm going to write the notation in MATLAB, which is it, which is the easiest way to use it. Um, so if you have a matrix P, you call SVD, and you set it equal to these three matrices. Is SVD a built-in function? Yes, it's, it's it's built in. It's built into just about every language that is able to understand what a matrix is. So there's this library. Um, called LaPad, um, which is written in Fortran and has been highly optimized for many different types of matrices. If it's sparse, if it's not sparse, you can do stuff. And for many years, people have been highly optimizing this in, in Fortran. And this is the back end that's used for just about every in, in, for every language. So you can, if, if you just call it in MATLAB or there's Octave, which is open source, it's going to go to this library and call it. If you have, if you do C, you can install a library called Lockpack, and you might need Locks, also another one, and then you can call it. Although I've done that a few times, I always pull my hair out trying to use it in C. Um, but you can, you can use it in C, and it's the same code, so it's going to be just as fast. You hear MATLAB is slower for certain things. It's designed to work with matrices, and so when it calls SVD, it's not slow. If that's your core operation, you're not really losing anything. Losing because it's um, it's doing some stuff at runtime that, that C would pre-compile. But if most of the time is in the SVD, then it's going to be basically just as fast as MATLAB. Um, so for the the homework for this, I'm going to tell you some MATLAB things to call, and it'll be easy to do. Or you can use Octave if you don't have MATLAB. Um, okay, so you're going to call this operation, and you're going to get out these three things: U, S, and V. And these are also going to be um, matrices, and there's going to be a whole bunch of cool information packed in these. And so I'm going to spend basically the rest of the lecture trying to tell you what, what is packed into this, this, this information. Um, okay, so the simplest one is, is going to be, oh, so, so, so first of all, you can actually, when you do this, you can kind of throw away P afterwards. You can write P is equal to U S times V transpose. So, so you can recover P. Now, if if you are if if you work in um, on numerical linear algebra and I said you can recover P, you might um, throw something at me. But it's because you know you're you're doing some you have to do some operations and there's some rounding errors and uh, you may not require recover everything, but you know it's it's usually not too far off. Um, if you pass in p with integers, it may give you a bunch of 0. 0.000001 in MATLAB or something like that. Um, but the the SVD in general is a fairly stable operation, so don't worry too much about losing stuff. And in fact, you'll see the stuff you lose will probably be the stuff that you don't care about. Anymore. So. You, you effectively won't, won't lose, won't lose it. Um, okay, so um, 
the, the, the simplest of the matrices is going to be S. Um, and this is, S is sometimes written in like, um, like sigma. Um, uh, but I don't know, you, you can't write sigma in um, MATLAB, so I'm just going to call it S. Um, and, and so this is going to be um, a diagonal uh, matrix. And it's also going to be um, D by N. And if you're used to matrices, this shouldn't totally make sense, but I'll explain what this means. If, if it's diagonal, it should be square, but we're going to kind of pad it with some zeros. Okay, so um, so that this so, so, so this diagonal matrix is gonna have just values on its um, just values on its um, just values on its on diagonals, and it's gonna look like this to um, down to sigma d, and um, I always get. So this is D by N. Alright, so this so it's going to have D columns and so it's going to have some extra rows down here as well. So the rows is going to go down to N, right? And and this, these are all going to be zero. Okay, and so it's going to also have a property that um, Di is always going to be greater or equal to, or sigma i is always going to be greater or equal than sigma i plus one. So these are going to be in sorted order. Um, so the, the output of 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 Matt will do this for you. You know, sort these. Although this this isn't that important to get the same sort of decomposition, but they'll be in sorted order, and the ordering of them will tell us how important things are. Um, okay. Um, so I'll talk more about this later, but it's really only giving us these d, d different values, and only the first ones will be important. Um, now these u and d matrices are going to be orthogonal. Um, u and d are going to be orthogonal. Um, and so u is going to be the n by n. And B is going to be D by D. Um, um, okay, so um, so what does it mean for a matrix to be orthogonal? Right. So the right way to think about it is that it's somehow rotating your data, or at least that's the geometric way of thinking about it. And I'll try and I'll give some concrete example where we'll see how it rotates the data. So it's Rotating the data, it can also do like a mirror flip. So it can rotate it around and then it can flip it over itself. If it's if it's uh, if it can't do the flip, then it's called special orthogonal. But it, it, these will be orthogonal. Um, and so it's going to have properties that so you can write, um, for instance, u as the set u1, u2, up to un. And so, yeah. And and so each UI is is going to have the property that its norm is equal to one. So each of the columns is going to have norm equal to one. This is uh, the two norm. If I if I don't write it, it's the it's the two. I think orthonormal is my orthonormal. Is there a name for that? Yeah. So I think it's. Quite also, also orthonormal. That's the stronger. So orthonormal is the rows and the columns yeah. are 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 going to be the the uh, the norms equal to one, right? Okay. Uh, um, so the, that means that if this is, so, this is saying. Um, each um, each column is a unit um, vector, and you also have um, and also each row is is a unit 
vector. So you can you can also decompose it in rows and that also can be yeah. Shouldn't the best values be n cross d instead of d cross n? Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's possibly right. Uh, It's n cross. Okay, good. So if it's n cross d, so I'll sh check this later when I use that. If it's n cross d, then it means is it longer than it is tall? I always get these confused. So if you're better at this, please. But so this multiplication so should be true. So basically, it's going to be n to n cross d, or u should be d cross d. Uh, uh, um, so you should be n cross n. So basically, this should be n cross d. The what? So this is two. So s s should be n cross d, right? And then n cross d means that it should be more more rows, more rows and columns. Yeah. So that's what it's. Oh, oh, so oh uh, I, I add more rows and columns. Okay, good. All right. So. Um, so one of my weaknesses is understanding matrices. It seems arbitrary to me, but um, okay. So okay, well, what are other properties of um, of the matrix being orthogonal? It's that um, if you look at any any of two of these of these rows or of these uh, these columns, um, then you're going to have that U. I, um, the dot product of u j is going to be equal to zero. So, so this means that if I were to draw these these unit vectors, they're going to be at this right angle to each other. Um, and this is, you know, so if I multiply any component along one of these, it's if I multiply the x component and the y component, the x component 1 is going to be 0, and the y component this one's going to be 0, so the sum is 0. Um, but it, it, it could be that they're also like this. Um, they're, tw they're twisted, um, and they're still a right angle, but the dot product will still be 0. So you don't need to be aligned to the original axis. Right. So, so it just means that they have a right angle. Now, in higher dimensions, the notion of a right angle um, actually still works, right? So I can have vectors at a right angle, and I can rotate them around. There's there's another vector out there in three space, right? But any these two define a plane, and inside that plane, they're at a right angle. So so this intuition of a right angle between vectors makes sense, even if you're in higher dimensions. Um, okay, so um, so then the other cool property is that. It's transpose um, is um, um, it, it is also its inverse. So u transpose is equal to u um, u inverse. So if you remember from Monday, as I said, we to do the linear regression, we had to do um, take the inverse of a matrix, and this was kind of like a higher dimensional variation of dividing by something. And it was it can be expensive. Well when it's just your transpose, then you're just, you know, just the transpose is you, you switch the columns and the rows. And, uh, and 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 so this this is not expensive. So this is a nice property to have for these orthogonal matrices. And so it'll cause some some things to cancel. Um, so uh, so what this means is that um, <coughs> u times u transpose is going to be equal to 1. Uh, u transpose. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. U transpose u is going to be equal to 1. Right. And also we have a, another condition that i is not equal to j in there. Yeah, for i not equal to j. Thank you. Because so ui dot product with itself is the norm, and that's going to be 1. Is there some term for a matrix that has that property that the transpose is equal to the inverse? Um, I think every orthogonal matrix has a property. I think that's the property of that's.
That's the same as being orthogonal. Okay, good. The people who, who, under, who remember this more are not disagreeing with me. Um, so, uh, okay, so, um, so the, the, these properties are really important because what that's saying is that you should only think about it like a rotation, but the rows and, and also the columns are forming a basis, right? So, so uh, um, uh, a basis is is a way of writing dimensions, uh, or if, of a uh, there's some so it's so it's it's going to have the property that you can write. Every point P, right? So this is a point in in, in R D, and I'm able to write P as exactly I equals one to D of um, of let's see of of A I U I, right? So this basis allows me to write this. So this A I is so that this uh, uh, So basically, there exists these AIs such that I can write this. Um, so that's not necessarily true um, for if it was not orthogonal, uh, if, 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 if it was not a basis. Um, but it, in, in fact, the AIs are going to be P dot UI. Right, so if I took this dot product onto this onto this vector ui, I'm going to get out this value. So this dot product is, this, is the length of the projection. Right, so I've got some, some point, you know, I've, I'm sitting in this high dimensional space. So, so this is my point p. I'm going to have this vector ui. And so then, I can I, I can do this projection onto here, and this length is p u i. It's it's the length of this thing, and it's the length that's going along this u i. Right. So if I multiply this value by this unit vector u i, it's going to give me back the vectors. Right. So that's what I wrote over here as this l p. Remember this this. Um, is the projection. And because I've got this property where they, they form the, this, these right triangles, you could think of every other vector is, you know, this is uj is coming up here and this is a right triangle, right? So if, if I projected it on here instead, then this is p dot uj is this distance here. Because it's a right triangle, I haven't lost anything. I've got some here, and I've, I've got this component. You know, the part I've, if there's only two dimensions, there's part that I've, the length of the projection is what's left over here. Now, in higher dimensions, you can you decompose into all these different pieces. Okay. Um, all right. So now, in particular, these um, sigma i's are called the Singular um, values of p, right? So if I decompose it, these are the singular values, and then uh, um, these um, these columns, these uis, are going to be the left. Um, singular, um, the left singular vectors, and then I can do the same thing with with v. You know, v is also orthogonal, but it's going to be d by d, and so so, so these are v one, v two, up to v d, and so the v i are going to be the 
write um, singular um, vectors. All right, so this is, you know, the, the, the so these are the, a lot of the properties that you get out um, um, from a kind of matrix perspective, right? So what I'm going to try and do now is, is go through an example and give you uh, an even more um, geometric perspective of, um, of what's going on here. So um, in, in particular, these, uh, these vectors are n-dimensional vectors. And these are d-dimensional vectors. Now, our data started out in a um, d-dimensional space. And so the ones from d are going to be easier to understand, because they're d-dimensions, and they're going to correspond with the same d-dimensional space. These n-dimensional vectors are going to be a little bit trickier to understand, and we'll um, get to those eventually. And the sigmas will be easy once we understand what, what these b's are. Um, um, all right, so 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 is anyone have any questions up to, up to this point? What's up here? And I and I didn't. Yeah. Why are they called sigmas? I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, I don't think it's named after Mr. Singular or anything like that. Um, uh, I, I, that probably comes from some term in the uh, uh, linear algebra community that relates to something, but, uh, but I'm not sure um, where it comes from. Um, all right, so we're going to start with an example where we're going to have a point set P, um, and we'll write this as this matrix. So for three, two, two, minus one, minus two, <coughs> minus five, minus two. Right. Okay, so this means I've got 